New Zealand is obsessed with concrete slabs. Over recent years, concrete has encompassed up to 80% of floors in New Zealand. I'm Josh, a builder here in New Zealand, and in this video, we're gonna talk about two main foundation systems, concrete and timber. And we'll discuss some of the reasons you would go one way or the other. I'll talk about my thoughts on both processes, and we'll discuss the pros and cons of each. Stick around to the end of the video where I'll talk about why I think Kiwis are obsessed with concrete slabs. If you drive around a new subdivision in New Zealand, you'll see nothing but concrete slabs and it'll seem like no one is building with timber anymore. Whereas do that 60 years ago and there would be no concrete slabs. Almost every house would be up out of the ground on piles timber floor with wooden floorboards laid down. For the first century of New Zealanders building homes, timber subfloors was the way to go. But in the 1970s, concrete slabs began to take off and it hasn't stopped. What is a concrete slab? Exactly that, a big hunk of concrete laying on the land. There's a couple of different ways to do it. A rib rust slab floats on top of the ground, or you can do a traditional 3604 slab with a footing cut into the earth, and then you build up the middle and you pour a topping layer. No matter how you start, whether it's a block ring foundation or a 3604 footing or a rib rust system, you follow a very similar process. They all start with you scraping off any topsoil and soft spots, laying down base course and getting your building site level. You then lay binding sand and DPM and you put your reinforcing and concrete foundation system on top of this. You also set up what's called formwork or boxing. This provides a hard edge for the concrete to set to and gives you a level height that the concrete places use to screed the concrete nice and level. One of the biggest pros of a concrete slab is that it is a faster construction method for the builder in particular. Start to finish, you could have a slab down in as little as 10 working days, and you can then walk onto a nice flat surface ready to start building your home. It's also a very cost effective way to put a foundation down, and in my experience, is cheaper than a timber floor by at least 25%. But that obviously depends on the site you're building on and the amount of prep you have to do to get a flat area. A concrete slab has an element of insulation in it. This helps you maintain a consistent indoor temperature. On top of that, systems like a rib raft slab or max raft incorporate the thermal properties of polystyrene to further bolster the insulation value. As we touched on before, concrete is a strong, durable product that is super stable. One more benefit of concrete slabs is you can build them much lower to the ground, and this leads to a better integration and indoor-outdoor flow. Talking about foundations, you guys are the foundation of making these videos. Go ahead, click subscribe. It's one of the easiest ways you can show your support and help us hit our goal of 100K subs. concrete does have its downfalls. One of the biggest ones is that concrete cracks. No matter what you do, no matter where you put the control joints, no matter how much you control the process, it will crack. This is because concrete is forever curing and the cure process means it's trying to pull itself apart. Soil movement and temperature changes can also contribute to cracking. On top of cracking, your concrete slab is also less flexible than timber. This does mean that in earthquake prone areas, it can be susceptible to structural damage if it hasn't been designed accordingly. Installation of concrete slabs often requires heavy equipment like diggers, concrete trucks, pumps. If you don't have room on site for this, then it's not gonna be a feasible option. As well as all that, you need a flat site to pour concrete, or you need to create a flat site. And so if you did sit on a concrete slab, but you're on a sloping site, 
you will have to use a combination of cuts and fills to create those flat areas to build your concrete slabs. One last thing to mention is that once a concrete slab is poured, it is very hard to change it and very costly. There are real clever people out there that can lift them up or inject stuff below them if there has been movement, but it's a very timely, costly process to rectify a faulty concrete slab. Moving on to timber subfloors. Timber subfloors are a framed structure that sits above the ground. First up, we put piles in the ground. Depending on where good ground is and what type of pile you're installing, it can go anywhere from as little as 200 mils into the ground for an ordinary pile, 450 mils for a braced pile, or 900 mils for an anchor pile. These are cut to height, you then install bearers. These are large horizontal timber beams that are laid on foundations or piles to support the joists. On top of the bearers, you lay joists. Joists are smaller horizontal timber beams that are fixed perpendicular to the bearers. And lastly, you lay your flooring sheets. And these are usually panels of plywood or particle board, and they are fixed to the joist from above to form the floor surface. They provide a solid flat surface for the final floor coverings that will go above them, such as carpet, tiles, or vinyl. Some of the pros of timber subfloors include flexibility of design. If you have a site that's sloping even just a little bit, timber subfloors can accommodate this. And they're perfect for sites where there is a huge slope and you need to build out from the land. As you can see on one of our sites here, in the front corner of the build, we are the minimum 450 out of the ground, and on the back side, we are over two meters out of the ground. This is a great example of where timber piles is the most economical way to get a floor structure down. Timber subfloors also allow for ease of access to everything under the floor, such as plumbing, waste, and electrical. This also means that future renovations or repairs are much easier than a concrete slab. And timber is a super earthquake resistant product. This is because it's strong, but it has a little bit of flex and a little bit of give. And when that earthquake starts to shake, that flexibility means that it moves with the earthquake instead of being rigid and snapping. Basically, timber subfloors can withstand ground shaking better than concrete foundations. However, there are some cons. First up, timber is super sensitive to moisture. You can counteract that in a number of ways, such as building it far enough off the ground that it's not absorbing it, put DPM over the dirt and provide adequate ventilation. But you can often see that moisture has been an issue in older homes where none of these things have happened. Another thing about timber subfloors is that there's often a lot of movement and creaking. Again, this is because timber is a natural product that expands and contracts over time. There are ways to minimize this using the correct fixings, gluing down your flooring sheets, making sure that there's enough blocking, and saying that you will always find a creaky spot. And as we mentioned earlier, timber subfloors cost more than traditional slabs. I think this is a combination of both the labor and the materials adding up. But that's only when you look at a flat slab in comparison with a flat subfloor. If you look at the ground buildup plus the flat slab versus this timber cost, it often means that timber subfloors are a more economical option where there's a large amount of ground buildup. One more thing, timber subfloors are not great insulators. And so you counteract this by putting in polystyrene sheets or fiberglass between the joists. This also adds more to your build cost than if you were on a concrete slab. As we mentioned earlier, there is two main types of timber flooring. There is particle board, such as the most popular choice strand floor, and there is plywood. Particle board is a very, very common option used in a large amount of residential and light commercial builds. It's made from mulched up 
wood particles that are then bonded together with resin under heat to form nice clean mint sheets. They come in nice big long 3.6 meter sheets and they are lightweight. This makes it easy to maneuver them around on site, especially if you're walking up or down a hill. They can be quickly screwed off. You can see here on the section nobody wanted, I got all of the upper floor down in one day. If you're putting particle board down in wet areas, it needs to have an H3 treatment. However, the preferred method is to put plywood down in all of these areas. In the 1980s and 1990s, particle board was also called wheat bix because as soon as it got wet, it crumbled like a bowl of wheat bix They've resolved those issues now and your particle board can withstand up to eight weeks in the weather before it starts to deteriorate. Plywood comes in sheets 1.2 meters wide, 2.4 meters long, and plywood is made by bonding together layers of timber. There's some really cool YouTube videos on that. They spin a log around and a knife peels out parts of the tree. That then gets laid down, they all get pressed together. It is fascinating to watch. Plywood is generally more expensive than strand floor and is actually better at repelling moisture. We have had builds where the client has requested that the entire subfloor is built with plywood and they've been willing to pay the extra cost for this. There is also another option coming to the market that may prove more popular in the future, and that is CLT, cross laminated timber. Last year we had the opportunity to visit a Red Stag CLT factory in Rotorua. I was amazed to see the large flooring sheets they can create with CLT and hear about some of the huge spans they can cover. You can drop in up to 75 square meters at once and your floor is ready to go. This is a really exciting opportunity and also Timber is making a research in general. They are exploring more ways to do multi-story timber buildings and this will become a key component of that. The use of concrete flooring continued to trend downwards this year after a slight uptick in 2016. The percentages include upper floors, usually wood-based, and so these are impacted by the trend towards multi-storey buildings, which made up 14% of new dwellings in 2019. When you're building multiple storeys in New Zealand, the most common method is to do a timber mid-floor, with these flooring sheets being the topping layer. However, it is possible to do suspended concrete floors. This is more popular in settings such as apartment builds than it would be in multi-unit townhouses. In saying all that, the numbers are clear right now. New Zealand is obsessed with concrete slabs. Four out of five jobs are concrete slabs. I would say it's even more for a builder like me where eight or nine jobs out of 10 are concrete slabs. And I'm making sure that my next personal build is all out of concrete because when I built on the section nobody wanted, the main part of the house was a timber subfloor. And this was because of the sloping nature of the site. However, We've got kids who stomp around the house like little elephants and you can hear them walking from one end of the house to the other. That is why my next build is going to be concrete slabs hunkered down into the ground. But you'll be able to watch more of that when we start kicking that build off later this year. Why else do I think concrete's the most popular? It's more economical to install. It's a stronger durable material. It does not transport the sound of elephant feet. And foundation crews have had a surge, whereas previously a carpenter would do the entire job start to finish working with timber. Now we have a foundation crew that comes in and gets a slab down, and then the builder turns up and starts working with the timber frames. If you had a already, also go and watch our timber frame video and find out why New Zealand's obsessed with that.